as long as they're financial. 888-99-CHARTERS, our number, 888-992-4278. Let's go ahead and take our first caller question from Roger in Palo Alto. Hi, Roger. Hi there. I had a question about the uh, inflation rate for many years, a long time ago, 4% was considered to be normal. Yep. Now they're talking 2 and right. there's been a change in the way this is calculated because most people don't need much housing, food, or energy, and they've changed the way that's calculated. And what are your views on, is that a factor of 2 or a difference of 2? Yeah, they changed it a number of years ago to reduce the top-line inflation number, and I, I just think that was wrong. Um, we still use a lot of energy. I mean, uh, why would you make that less important? Energy and food are the most important things that you and I consume, so that affects us the most, and they keep quoting... Uh, you know, as a quick quote of inflation, uh, uh, X energy and food, uh, uh, the inflation was this. Well, wait a minute. We can't X it out of our lives. I think that the if you see what they they when you see 5% inflation reported fed, uh, officially, probably closer to 7. That's what I think. Because I think that they when they recalculated it, I, I don't agree with it. It's a thousand item basket that they count. A thousand item basket. And the way they count it really bothers me because if you had an iPhone that uh, went up in price $200 for a brand new one from a one last year, they will say that's not inflation because it has more features or a computer or, you know, a laptop or, you know, it, it, it makes no sense. We still have to pay $200 more for it, but they say it's more efficient. Therefore, it, there is no inflation in the price. Well, I think that's kind of ridiculous. But that's how they do it. So, no, I don't agree with the official numbers. I think they're always low, to be honest. Roger, thank you very much. We're going to go to Paul in San Francisco. Wants to talk about Social Security. Hi, Paul. Yes, I'm Paul. I've heard over the radio that Social Security payments are taxed at the highest rate of 85% of a person's income. But at what level of income does that become 85%? No, it's not taxed at 85%, but 85% of your Social Security benefit is taxed. Okay? Okay, so it's not like that. the rate is more for them. It's that the most of the money in can of your Social Security benefit is will be taxed as income. So whatever income tax bracket you're in is what you will pay on most of your Social Security, generally speaking. Unless that's all you're getting and you're getting very little and you're in a you know, poverty level, then, yeah, your tax rate will be very, very low. Okay? So it's not an 85% tax rate. It's 85% of your benefits will be taxed at your ordinary income rate for that year, whatever that rate is. So if you're making a lot of money and, you know, uh, in any way you're still working or you are uh, got a huge pension plan, and then you're collecting Social Security, well, much of that money is going to be taxed. Thanks for the call, Paul. Appreciate it. Do you have questions about FDIC security, mortgages, money market funds, losses to your retirement plans? Give us a call today, 888-99-CHART. Hey, guys. uh, James from Washington State. Just had a quick question for you. Wondering if we should be investing in other exchanges and how exactly we would go about doing that. So, obviously, I'm invested in a bunch of international companies or international stocks through the New York Stock Exchange or the exchanges we have available here in the U.S., for diversification purposes, are there others outside of the U.S., uh, other exchanges that we should be uh, looking at trading stocks on? Uh, appreciate uh, any information or any thoughts you may have on it. Thanks, Mike. Well, investing abroad is not a bad thing, especially now that the dollar is in a downtrend uh, and likely due to our debt situation and our demographic situation, you know, it's going to be increasingly difficult for the Fed to raise rates to uh, become, you know, become super hawkish. So they're going to longer term have to err on the side of dovishness, which means probably a weaker dollar. Now, that would be beneficial for companies that are listed abroad. Uh, Some are duly listed here in the US, uh, some through an ADR, uh, and that's a good way to get exposure. Well, there's nothing wrong with buying companies and other exchanges as well. 
but you have to keep an eye on the geopolitical concerns and the currency risk. Now, you don't just say, oh, I'm going to buy a company on another exchange on a whim <laughs> just because it is listed uh, abroad. You have to have sound, sound investment reasons to, to buy it. Uh, but there are a lot of great values overseas, especially in relation to what you're seeing here on domestic exchanges. So yes, the answer simply is yes, you should be looking at other opportunities abroad. Doesn't mean you buy them necessarily, uh, but you're gonna get a different subset of, of opportunities. Get ready for a new KPP Financial Wealth Webinar, Value Investing, Positioning Your Portfolio for profitability, relative price, and dividend payments. The Wealth Webinar will be a crash course on how to structure your value portfolios, providing real examples with assessment tools that KPP Financial uses every day to grow clients' wealth. The webinar will be anchored by KPP Financial CEO and Invest Talk host, Justin Klein, and by KPP Financial Portfolio Manager, Luke Guerrero. Mark your calendar for Wednesday, March 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. You are invited to a new KPP Financial Wealth Webinar. Be sure to tell your friends and family members it's free and you can register now at investtalk.com. You're listening to an encore presentation of Invest Talk. Please call with your questions and comments, though, 888 99CHART, 888 99CHART, and Steve will answer them on the next Invest Talk. I've just got a question about transferring either cash or equities from individual taxable account into a Roth IRA. I'm assuming if I transfer cash, it's just going to be deducted from my 6000 cap for the year. But I'm wondering what happens if I transfer shares or a whole position? Does it get deducted from my max contribution at the value of it at the time I trade it? Or is there any considerations or things to think about when transferring things over like that? Thank you guys very much. Appreciate all you do. Have a good one. Good question. This is easy. You can only fund a Roth IRA with cash with cash. Now you can move, you can combine IRAs, if you have multiple IRAs, you can combine them all together uh, into one. Now you don't want to commingle Roth and traditional IRA assets, uh, unless you're doing a Roth conversion of some type. Um, but you can't do that. I know a lot of people try to get around that or whatever, but you have to use liquid cash into a Roth IRA, then you can go buy whatever equities you want, etc but you need to do it with cash. You can't just transfer the equities in. Thanks for the call. Hi, guys. Uh, my question is regarding when you calculate ratios for companies, do you usually use the gap or non-gap? Because, you know, some of these numbers vary so much. What is your policy uh, when you do your calculations in general? Thank you. We absolutely 100% do not use non-GAAP. Non-GAAP is something I think should be illegal. I don't think companies should be able to basically make up their own measurement for their earnings. That's what non-GAAP is. It doesn't adhere to generally accepted accounting principles. That's what GAAP is. So the question is, what it what are their principles? This is something that happens a lot in the tech industry. I remember we work was they had their own, which was like community adjusted earnings or cash flow or something. Basically stripped out all their expenses. So the simple thing, gaps there for a reason. So that when you're judging earnings from one company to another, it's based on the same principles not based on the principles that some management team made up to make themselves look better, which happens all the time. Now they'll make excuses like, you know, we're just trying to give you a better view of whatever. But a real analyst, a real investor, 
is not going to really use PE anyway, right? We don't really use earnings per share that much anyway. I have many other metrics I can use to filter out the noise from cash from operations to EBITDA to EBIT, return invested capital, return assets. There's a lot of other metrics to use that are that give more insight into the business than straight up PE ratios. PE ratios, frankly, they're old and antiquated. And then when you throw in a made up number like non-GAAP, it makes them even more useless. So hopefully that gives you a little perspective on our perspective for non-GAAP. The Invest Talk Voice Bank never closes. I have a question for you about Amazon. So your questions keep coming. Question about PE ratios. And that's okay because Steve Peasley and Justin Klein specialize in unbiased guidance. If I'm looking at a dividend company, I'm looking for consistency of earnings and dividends. Your standard daily chart typically goes back one year. Steve and Justin are fearless, so don't forget to call Invest Talk. 888-99-CHART. Okay, we're going to go talk to Gene in Raleigh, North Carolina, reloca- relocating to a retirement spot. Are you are you there, Gene, or are you, you're still moving? Oh, no, it's a couple of years away, but uh, I was curious. Uh, in the past, you know, you've talked uh, about, in past shows, you've always talked about uh, relocating from a high-cost state to a, a, a lower-cost Low cost. state. And I'm wondering, have you seen any trends in the people you're dealing with, or you've heard the news about people moving out of the country to particular areas to for uh, for retirement to to lower the cost, yes. particularly uh, areas in Mexico or Canada yes. or even other countries. Yeah, oh, we call those expats. But I have a client; uh, she uh, lives in Oklahoma, which is not a high cost place, but she likes to go to Mexico in the winter. Because it's so cold in Oklahoma. So that's what she does. And the cost is really, really low for her to lease a place for like three or four months, five months in Mexico. But there's also people that move completely out of the country and don't plan on coming back. Even, even I even talked about earlier this week or late last week about people, billionaires, moving out of the country and, and getting rid of their U.S. citizenship because of the tax, high taxes. But... One of the destinations people like is Panama. Now, I don't think I could take Panama because of the humidity, but you can live right on the water, lots of islands, uh, and pretty reasonably. And people like it because they use U.S. dollar, they speak English, that kind of thing, so it's easy. Um, I also had a client who moved to uh, the Philippines, and he doesn't make much money. He wasn't wealthy. Uh, doesn't have a lot of retirement money, so he moved there. He can live very well on his Social Security alone in the Philippines. Uh, so, yeah, people move. Two tips. I, I did hear about the Philippines, and I think in general what I, I heard is uh, uh, two good tips is to, un- to understand the entire season of wherever you live, the weather, yeah. and also know what type of uh, rules apply to pe- uh, foreigners who own properties yeah you got yeah some places won't let you buy property some places won't let you in uh um at all europe a lot of places you can't move to europe you just can't drop and say i'm gonna go move to france you can't do that they have very strict rules in various countries in europe thanks a lot yeah appreciate the call thank you you're listening to Invest Talk, everybody. I'm Steve Peasley. We want to answer your questions. Our listener line number is always ready for you, 888-99-CHART. Beginning our experience, we're here to answer your question. You're listening to an encore presentation of Invest Talk. Please call with your questions and comments, though, 888 99 Chart, 888 99 CHART, and Steve will answer them on the next Invest Talk. This is Alan from Hayward, California. I uh, love the show. I learn a lot all the time. When I think of passive investing, I think of set it and forget it. It doesn't matter if it's a red or green day for the share price, you buy it regardless. So when people invest in a cyclical company like ExxonMobil only for the dividend income, should they be concerned about when to buy it 
or can they set it and forget it and buy it at whatever price it's at so long as they're only in it for the dividend income? Should I be concerned about the share price and paper losses of my principal while passively collecting the dividends? Exxon is a dividend aristocrat, which means its dividend is generally considered safe. If not Exxon Mobil, are there any individual paying companies that I can passively set it and forget it? Thanks. Love the show. There are. But Exxon Mobil is one of them. They're big blue chip companies. You can buy them and forget about them. But I don't like to buy them after they've had a pretty strong run up. I, I wait. I wait till the cycle's down. So I bought Exxon and Chevron, you know, a while back when they were much more, you know, attractive. Okay. Now at 116, it, it's gone from like $35 in 2020 to 116. So it's hesitated around 60, which was the a good buying opportunity. Uh, and now it's 116. I, I think I'd wait for a pullback. But yeah, um, the most common things that you could buy and set and forget is in, index funds. You, you, there's a ton of index funds that slice and dice up the market. You could buy those ETFs for those index funds, buy them whenever you want to, and forget it. You could do that. Now, of course, everybody wants to buy low but I, uh, and, and, and uh, let it ride up, but most people have a hard time buying low because everything is going down and everybody's panicking and uh, the stocks are falling and they don't want to buy. But that's exactly when you should buy. When everybody else is a seller, you should be the buyer. When everybody else, not just some people, I'm talking about an overall market fall like it did last year, you need to be a buyer. Okay, and if you're not and you're a buy and holder, just hold it through the dark times. You'll be fine. You will be just fine. Mark your calendar for Wednesday, March 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. You are invited to a new KPP Financial Wealth Webinar. Value investing, positioning your portfolio for profitability, relative price, and dividend payments. Be sure to tell your friends and family members about the new KPP Financial Wealth Webinar. It's free, and you can register now at investtalk.com. Thanks for your guys' show. Today I had a question on um, railroad stocks. I just wanted to get your overall opinion. I've heard people talk about them in a positive way, negative. I'm just looking to see what you guys think about them. Um, I have a few on my uh, screen here, CFX, Canadian National Railway. Canadian Pacific Railway, Norfolk, Southern Corporation, Union Pacific, just if any of those are good investments or something that I should look into, or if you could just talk about why railroad stocks are bad investment based off of one of those companies, just something to kind of help direct me on how I should be looking at these, if at all. I'll be looking forward to hearing your answer on the podcast, and uh, thanks as always, guys. Well, Railroad companies are definitely not bad investments. They typically, most of them are very profitable and consistently profitable. They have a, a monopoly on the routes that they own. And usually there's not a whole lot of cheaper alternatives. Especially if oil prices continue to stay relatively high, right? The trucking costs would continue to go up. So... I actually like the railroads longer term, but you have to be very specific on which railroads and regions you're talking about, right? So companies like Norfolk, as well as CSX, they're mainly focused on the eastern part of the United States. And I think net-net, they'd probably be beneficiaries longer term of deglobalization, just because there's still a lot of industrial base that happens in the, the Midwest and East Coast. But when it comes to companies like Union Pacific, which pretty much dominates the Western United States, they benefited dram dramatically from everybody or all these companies exporting production to China because they're the ones that were bringing it from the ports in Los Angeles and, and Long Beach, the two busiest ports in the country, into the center of the country. And so 
that's what you want to think about first off is which ones to pick, which ones are going to benefit the most from deglobalization, which ones are going to be hurt the most. But in general, they, are ten, they tend to be good businesses to own. Now, when I speak about all that, that's more medium to long term. The difficult part near term is the ebbing demand for physical goods. Talked about this for a while. Everything's mean reverting back to pre-pandemic levels of consuming services versus physical goods. Obviously, railroads don't move services. So people are buying more services versus goods. Net net, that's negative for railroads. So once we get on the other side of this, I think it's fully right the ship when it comes to inventories and consumer demand, etc. You can start thinking about buying those railroads that will benefit from deglobalization. Hope that helped. You can call right now and be part of the program. Let's hear about what your talking point is. 888-99-CHART, 888-992-4278, and you can get through right now. Listening to an encore presentation of Invest Talk. Please call with your questions and comments though, 888 99 Chart, 888 99 CHART, and Steve will answer them on the next Invest Talk. We're going to go up to Stockton, California and talk with Wesley and we'll talk about asset allocation. My question is a two partner one is asset allocation and a 401k. Um, I know that we're bigger on small cap and maybe internationals. What do you think of a small cap international fund? Thank you. Well, asset allocation in your 401k, a lot of that depends on your age, your risk tolerance level, et cetera. Uh, small, cap, small caps right now, generally, uh, across the world, have better value than the larger caps relatively. And foreign stocks also have uh, are cheaper in general. Now, part of that is because they should be cheaper because of geopolitical concerns here in the U.S. We're fairly insulated, luckily. Uh, you know, we're, we're oceans away from any major geopolitical rival. So that's a good thing. Uh, and we have fairly stable political environment. So we should be trading at a premium compared to the rest of the world. But you could argue the premium is too large. So I would say that's generally a good idea. However, a lot depends on what fund in your 401k that is, you know, it could be a very bad fund within uh, that space. But as long as that, that uh, fund ranks out fairly well, not a bad place to put some allocation of your 401k. Now let's go back to the Best Talk Voice Bank at 888 chart Hey, Steve and Justin. Uh, my name is Eric. I live in southern Indiana. I work a lot. Blue collar guy. But my grandpa always told me to invest in SPY, SPY. So I've been doing that since the mid-90s. Well, I gradually went from that to VTI. And then with work, I have... F S K A X through Fidelity, all broad base index funds. I'm in my early forties now. I'm trying to understand if it's worth it to just investigate single stocks, companies. I don't have a lot of time. I could make time, but I'm curious because the SPIVA, S P I V A, the SPIVA results state that long term no one beats the index over twenty, thirty years. So I just wanted to see what you think about that. I'm not asking to point out your track record as a company versus an index over 20, 30 years. But just wanted to give your your advice. I just stick to the index or put aside three, four hours a week investigating companies. Because I can tell you right now, I like waste management. I like Costco, I like Dollar General, companies like that. But I know that anything can happen and the index is safe. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't say the indexes are safe. Just go look at 08, right? The S&P fell over 50% from peak to trough. So when you're talking about whether it's an active fund or an index, if you're just talking about equities, equities are not safe. You cannot use those two words in conjunction. Now, are there safer equities than others? Yes. They have less volatility than other equities? Yes. Obviously, large caps typically have lower volatility than small caps. Yes, there, there, are, there are broad generalities, but no equity, all equity portfolio is considered safe. Okay, now let's 
talk a bit about the indexes that you're speaking about. And you looked at Spiva, for example, and you said, nobody outperforms the indexes. And clearly that's wrong. Even Spiva says that. Going back 15 years, now they will say only about 10.5% of large cap funds beat the indexes. Only 10%. But that also means that those large cap funds are charging a fee that's probably higher than what the index funds are. So that's the vast majority of why they underperform. But if you go 10 years, still about 10% outperform. Five years, up to 15.5% outperform. Three years, 14%. But one year, up to 44% outperformed last year. And so there are, these things go in cycles. Everything has a cycle. Everything, short, medium, long-term cycles, typically active funds versus passive, they outperform based on, in various cycles, okay? For many years in the past, when value outperformed, for example, those active funds tended to outperform. When the S&P or the indexes in general get overweight too much sectors that are too expensive, eventually the tide goes out and that shifts back, right? So there's always those cycles. Now, if you don't have time to go and buy individual names and do the research and have the discipline and the data and the perspectives to make good decisions, you don't want to do a lot of work, the index is fine. You know, I would say you go find a value-based index. You can do it that way. I, I would argue that's better. Value tends to outperform longer term uh, over growth. And so that's what I would say. It's just use a, you could use an index, but a value index, for example. Okay. So trying to say active always underperforms because it doesn't. Nothing is absolute in the market. Nothing. Nothing's absolute. Nothing's guaranteed. You can't paint everything with a broad brush and say there are no caveats. There are always caveats to the general rule about almost everything in the markets. But those caveats typically have a caveat. They have a reason why they broke the mold. So, you know, and Spiva, which you're talking about, that's the S&P. They're, they're, they're there to champion indexing because they make money off indexing. It's just the way it is. So always think about these things dynamically and make sure whatever strategy you're deploying is right for you, the time and expertise you have, put it, have to put into it, your risk tolerance level, and make sure you never think of equities as low risk. They never are. This is Invest Talk, made possible by KPP Financial, where principals and Invest Talk hosts Steve Peasley and Justin Klein are independent financial advisors. For clients, they are fiduciaries. Steve and Justin have a duty and a commitment to always place the interests of their clients ahead of the firm. This is different from the way many other organizations operate. And one way you can realize the benefit of an association with KPP Financial is to know that KPP practices parallel investing. This means that the personal investment accounts of KPP principals participate with client investments at equal prices and percentages. It's an important difference. You can learn more anytime at investtalk.com or reach out to Steve Peasley and Justin Klein by emailing or calling their Irvine, California office. The Invest Talk radio and podcast continues now. The phone lines are open. Call with questions, 888-99-CHART. I'm asking about my 401k. It is enrolled in a, a Vanguard Target Retirement 2030. Now, I've noticed that it, it has a lot of... Uh, like 20% of it's in tech stocks. It looks like it's heavy in the growth. I was wanting to get your opinion of that particular fund 
and I have an option of like 24 other ones that I could potentially roll it over should I be looking at uh, maybe changing funds. I appreciate your help. Really appreciate the podcast and, uh, and enjoying learning from both of you. You're doing a great job. Have a great day. Okay, so he's in a, a 401k target dated fund, meaning you pick the date, 2030, 2035, 2040, uh, as to when your retirement date and the fund itself will adjust itself to become more conservative as you get close to retirement. Now, why I don't like them is hopefully you have other better choices, you know, variety. But why I really don't like them is that, you know, they completely ignores interest rates movement. For instance, the Fed right now is raising interest rates, and these funds are the bond funds and and you know conservative funds that the these these target dated funds move toward as you get closer to the retirement date. They buy bonds. They don't care rising interest rate, falling interest rates. And when the interest rates are rising, those bond values go down, so you're not really making you're losing money on them. Well, you can lose money in the stock market too, but don't think, and when the interest rates start to rise, okay, the, they go down. When the interest rates start to fall, they go up. So, you know, target date is 2030. That's what, seven years from now? I guarantee you interest rates will probably go down and up in that period of time. So, it, and your fund will just become more and more conservative. Anyways, the point is, I don't care for for them for that reason and a few other reasons. So I would suggest you look for other funds, you know, in your lineup. Say so you had twenty four, and that's quite a bit for four hundred one k actually. Do you have questions about FDIC security, mortgages, money market funds, losses to your retirement plans? Give us a call today, eight 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 ninety nine chart. Okay, let's go to another question from Alberto in San Jose. Hello, Steve. I love your show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for the call. So I've been dabbing in cryptocurrency uh, just a little bit less than or maybe 1% of my portfolio. Right now, I know most of them are down compared to last year. But my question is, is it better to invest in the platforms Coin or Robinhood rather than invest in individual cryptocurrencies? I mean, all of them trade on those, well, a lot of them trade on those platforms. So would it be better to buy the stocks for those platforms rather than individual cryptocurrencies? Well, it would be better to buy a basket of them, but I don't like cryptocurrency at all. I I think most of them will go bankrupt. There's only going to be, what, 5, 10 that survive out of 10,000 cryptocurrencies out there? Um, I, I, I'm just not keen on that space because there's, it's like the wild, wild west. I mean, you've probably seen the movements and everybody falls in love with some of those movements. If I would have bought it here, I would have been a 10,000 percent, you know, but you also lost 10,000 percent on some of it too. So, so it's so wild west and there's no, um, no government backing. There's no rules. It's very, very risky. Now, I'm glad you told me you only have 1%. So if I was going to invest 1%, which I don't have a problem with you taking a risk, Alberto, with 1%, I'd probably do an ETF of cryptocurrencies, a basket of, of them, which will include probably dominated by the biggest cryptocurrency, you know, the, the ones that we all know and hear about. So that's probably what I would do. I wouldn't invest in any one crypto, and I don't, I don't, think the platforms are the place to be. I don't. Alberto, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now let's keep things moving and play two in a row from our 24-7 listener line at 888-99-CHART. Hi, Stephen Justin. It's Art from Tucson. Hey, I was wondering what you thought about the Dogs of the Dow investment strategy for 2023. Just to give you the freedom to discuss some of the stocks, three of the Dogs of the Dow is usually the top 10 that are down the most in the Dow Industrial Average, as I understand it. I was looking at 3M, MMM, Intel, INTC, and uh, Walgreens, WBA. Uh, Those are three that are really down significantly. Just wondered what you thought about that theory. It's supposed to give uh, superior gains over um, a lot of years, at least. And I'll listen to your answer on the podcast. Thanks for all you do. 
Well, the dogs of the Dow aren't the 10 that are down the most. It's the 10 highest yielding, dividend yielding stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average at the beginning of each year. And for this year, 2023, it'd be Verizon. It's about 6.6% yield. Dow, chemical, 5.5. Intel, 5.5. Walgreens Boots, 5.14. 3M, right around 5%. IBM at 4.68. Amgen three and a quarter, Cisco three point two, Chevron three point one six, and J.P. Morgan right around three percent. So those are the dogs of the Dow for this year. Now, is it better than just owning the Dow outright? Yes, numbers play out. However, this is just simply a value strategy. It's really what it is. You're using one simple metric, a decent metric, but only one metric. And some of these companies I would invest in, some of them not so much. And, you know, because it doesn't take into account leverage, quality of their earnings, growth, things like that, that I think are important. And the numbers say they're important. So is this better than just buying the Dow? Yes. And it's very easy. But... That doesn't mean it's the best strategy. It's simply a better strategy than owning the Dow, and that's not saying much. Okay. So you know, you listed off some stocks, some of those are good, not so good, like I said. So, you know, we would you're not getting a lot of diversity, first off. That's a big problem. Only 10 stocks. The numbers say, hey, you need about 20, 25 different names to be properly diversified. And remember the Dow is 30 names. This is Dow is the worst. The worst. And this is one of those things that I don't talk about much because I feel like I've talked about it over the years so many times, but I know there's a lot of new investors, newer listeners. But the Dow Jones, even though it's talked about a lot, what did the Dow do? It's the biggest number, right? So if it moves 300 points, that sounds like a lot. Well, in reality, if the S&P moves 50 and the Dow moves 300, the S&P moves a lot more than the Dow, percentage-wise. And it's price cap weighted. It's literally, I don't want to use bad words, but it's literally the worst index ever to even pay attention to. It has no basis in understanding of what the market is doing or has done. But once again, a dogs of the Dow strategy, it's better than average, but it's still not great. Now, if you have a question about a stock or an IRA, college savings plan, well, maybe buying a house, mortgages, reverse mortgages, we're here for you. 888-99-CHART, 888-992-4278. You're listening to an encore presentation of Invest Talk. Please call with your questions and comments, though, 888 99 Chart, 888 99 C H A R T, and Steve will answer them on the next Invest Talk. Yes, uh, Justin, I have a strategy question. I own stock in a very good company. However, as many others have experienced, I overpaid and the stock has fallen and turned a handsome profit into a loss. Stocks now at or approaching an attractive buy point although I'm sure it would may go lower with the market. My question is, should I sell the stock for a tax loss, wait 30 days, and then see if it is an attractive to repurchase it, or hold the stock, buy more as it becomes attractive, and hold for the long term, anticipating a, a profit over that long term? I uh, appreciate your thoughts on this, and uh, great show. Thanks a lot. My name is Dick. Thank you. Bye. I'd probably take the loss. As uh, long as it's in a taxable account, then that's obviously you can apply the loss to gain, future gains, and wait the 31 days and buy it back because it had a great, we had a great January, really, a market up about 10%. So um, I, this would be the time to take a little profit and see if the market falls down. You can buy it back 31 days. I mean, I, I probably would take the loss. And then if I really still like the stock, buy back. Now, the risk you have is the stock could continue moving up, and then you just got out of a stock that you could have made money on. But, you know, we're still in a pretty difficult stock market environment. So I'm thinking January was a really good month, and that we'll have 
months that are going to be pulling back, and that might be a better uh, better strategy. Okay, just what I think. Okay, that's what I do. Hey, Stephen, Justin, this is Chaz from Virginia, a longtime listener of the podcast here. I had a question about investing in 529 plans. I was researching a lot of 529 plans across different states, and I was wondering if I start now from a time horizon of 18 years or so. I just had a baby, so, you know, like I have a long time horizon. Does it make sense to just start dollar cost averaging in an index fund, go find the cheapest available in any other states, and just start BCA in that? Is 18 years long enough time frame to do that? Or be some other kind of strategy that I should be looking into? I know long term you want to stay in the market and, you know, like for my retirement accounts, I just put it in index funds and I forget about it because I have like 30, 40 years before I retire. But what about 18 years? Is that long enough? I'd be waiting to hear the response in upcoming podcast. Thank you very much. The simple answer is yes. Okay. 18 years is long enough to benefit from an index fund. Why? Because historically, there's never been, uh, well, maybe there's been one or two, but there's very rarely do you have a 10-year period where the market is not up. It's always up. The average return is, what, 9%, maybe a little higher if you factor in dividends. I'm not sure, but, you know, it, it uh, 9% a year, that is. So, you know, in that 18 years, yeah. You should do well. And when you get close to the end period of that, then you're going to have to, and when I say close within the next, within three to four years, within the end period, like the 15th year or so, start being a little more cautious simply because the market might have spiked over the last year or two before that. And then it's going to fall just as you're going to need the money. So, and remember, you don't need the, all the money right the first year. You're, if the kid, if the child's going to go for four years college, you'll spread that out over time. So you'll have more time to have the investment work for you. So yeah, I say yes. Hello, uh, this is Tori from Bozeman, Montana. I'm calling to ask about a refinance that I'm currently in the middle of. So I'm refinancing a rental property that I own. And I was wondering, because I do have a good bit of equity in that property, and I haven't quite been maximizing my, my Roth contribution every year, so would it be smart to take some of that equity out of my house and actually just put it into my Roth IRA where I feel like it can make better returns and possibly beat what my home might be able to bring in terms of equity in the future? Uh, look forward to hearing your answer. Thanks so much. Bye. Well, normally I would say no. Don't take the equity out of your house, but but just contribute new money to the Roth. But with interest rates so very low, uh, you can borrow money against the house you live in at you know two and a half percent or so. Uh, that might be smart to borrow the money. Remember, it's always the best use of the money. What's the best use? I can make more than two and a half pretty confidently uh, in the market, conservatively, conservatively investing. So would it be? And, and I still get the two and a half percent plus write-off, uh, uh, mortgage write-off. Now you're talking about a rental property. I would borrow against your own personal property if you have equity in there because 